Hello, this is Nanobyte and today we are going to implement printf. In part 4 we got everything ready so that we can use C for further development of our bootloader. Today we will implement printf, which is going to be one of the most useful tools we can have for debugging. Here's the documentation page for the standard library printf which should give us a good starting point on what we have to do. As you can see, the printf function takes a format string and then a variable number of arguments, depending on the format string. The format string can contain this special sequence that starts with a percentage sign, which tells us how to interpret the arguments. The format specifier is quite complex, but we will keep our implementation simple and we will only implement the length and the specifier parts. The specifier tells printf what type of argument to expect. u for an unassigned integer, d for a signed integer, f is a floating point, s is a string, and so on. Also, to keep things simple, we will not implement the floating point specifiers. The optional length can be used to specify the size of a numeric type. The values we will support will be hh, h, l, and ll and we will ignore the others, j, z, t, and l, which are not as useful. The first topic we will go into is how to pass a variable number of arguments. As you have probably already seen, C allows us to pass an arbitrary number of parameters to a function that is declared with an ellipsis operator. The difficulty here is how to access these parameters in the printf implementation. If we had access to the standard library, we would be using a VA list, but here we have to do it manually. In part 4, we discussed at length about the CDECL calling convention, which is the one we will be using. If you haven't seen that section, I recommend you to watch it, as you will understand better what we are talking about. I put the link in the description with the timestamp to the explanation, so you don't have to watch the whole thing. To recap, a calling convention is basically a set of rules about how functions have to be called, how parameters are passed, and how the stack is managed. These are the rules that apply to the CDECL calling convention. These cover how the arguments are passed, how values are returned, which registers are saved by whom, and who cleans up the stack. This is the example we looked at in part 4, which shows how these rules are put into practice. Before the length squared function is called, the compiler has to generate some code that saves the contents of EAX, ECX and EDX, in case there's anything stored in these registers. This can be done by either pushing them to the stack or using some other free registers. Then the parameters are pushed from right to left, first Y and then X. Don't forget here that the stack grows downwards, so SP is decremented. Next, the compiler will generate the function call itself, which will push the return address to the stack. Going into the function, the first instructions will create a call frame by saving the old value of BP and then setting it to SP. BP is used to remember where the stack frame begins, which means that the region of the stack used by the currently executing function will always be between BP and SP. Also, because BP doesn't change inside the executing function, we can use it to calculate the argument addresses. In our case, BP plus 4 gives us the address of the first argument X and BP plus 6 to the second one Y. Once the function finishes its work, it stores the return value in AX. Then it has to restore all the registers that it changed to their original values, except for EAX, ECX and EDX, which were saved by the caller. Finally, it restores the stack to its original state by resetting SP and BP to the values they had before. The function now returns and the caller removes all the parameters it pushed from the stack. If all of these steps are done correctly, the stack should be in the same state that it was in before the function call was performed. Now let's see what calling printf would look like. In the simplest case, printf is called with only the format string as the argument. 
in this case the pointer of the format string is pushed to the stack and then printf is called. Just like before, the stack frame is created and then we can access the format argument by doing bp plus 4. What if we have four parameters? Remember that the parameters are pushed from right to left, so we first push 4 and then 3, then 2 and 1. And then the format string. Once again, the format parameter is at bp plus 4, same as in the first example. Now you can see the advantage of pushing the arguments from right to left, because it makes it much easier to properly handle functions being called with an arbitrary number of parameters. No matter how many parameters you have, you will always know where the first named arguments are. So how would we access these parameters in C? We already have the format parameter and we know that it is located at bp plus 4. So what we can do is create a pointer arc p which points to format and then increment it by the size of the format. And now arc p will point to the second argument. I know this may look very wrong for people who haven't worked at such a low level before, but this is the correct way of doing it. At this point we don't know the size of the argument. So we need to parse the format string in order to figure it out. Once we know the size, we can get the value and then move on to the third argument, and so on. Something to note here is that the stack pointer is always aligned to the bit size of the mode of the processor it is in. So in 16-bit real mode, any argument smaller than 16 bits, meaning the char or unsigned char, will be promoted to a 16-bit type. Same goes for 32-bit modes, any argument smaller than 32 bits will be promoted to 32 bits and in 64-bit mode everything is promoted to 64 bits. <laughs> now that we know how to access the arguments, let's talk about parsing the format string. The cleanest way of parsing would be to use a state machine, where we have a bunch of states and a bunch of transitions. We will use this example which should cover all the cases we will encounter. The first thing we need is to set up a few variables. The format variable keeps track of the current format character. Arc p keeps track of the next argument and should be initialized to point to the next argument after the format string. We also need a variable that holds the current state which will be initialized to the initial state that we call normal. The first character is t, what should we do with it? It's not a format specifier, so all we need to do is print it and move to the next character. This will be the first transition. For any character that is not a percentage sign, we print it and advance to the next character. And we remain in the normal state. The same thing happens for the next characters, e, s, t and space. Where things get a little bit more interesting is the percentage character, where we need to consider what the next characters are to make a decision. Looking at the documentation, here we have an optional flags field, followed by an optional width, precision, length and finally the specification. We decided to simplify our implementation so we will only support the length and specification fields. So when we are in the normal state and we encounter a percentage sign, we have to transition to a new state that we will call length. During the transition we need to consume the percentage sign, so we advance to the next character. The length is optional, so if we don't encounter a length character we will transition to the specifier state, where we will look at the specifier character. In this transition we don't consume any character. From the specifier state we have all the information we need to format and print the next argument, or in our case the percentage symbol. Now that we finished processing the format specifier we can transition back to the normal state. Now we are looking at another space character, so we remain in the normal state. Next we have another percentage character, so we switch to the length state and advance. The current character is S, which is not a valid length specifier, so we jump to the specifier state. Same as before, we print the string argument and move on. 
The same steps are repeated for the character and the integer arguments. We have reached a specifier which has a length attached, so let's see what we need to do here. Same as before, when we reach the percentage sign we move to the length state and advance. Now we have an L character, which is a valid length specifier. So we need another transition. Let's call this new state length long. From length long we have two possibilities. We can either get another L or we can get a specifier, so we will have two transitions. For the L character we will simply store the length and then increment the position. If we encounter any other character, we will simply jump to the specifier position without consuming any character. We took care of the long lengths, but now we need to take care of the short ones, where things are exactly the same. I hope this explanation made things clear about how I made the implementation. In retrospect, I think the state machine could be improved a bit by eliminating the specifier state and having all the asterisk transition go straight to normal and process the argument during the transition. This way all the transitions would have consumed characters, so the implementation could have been a bit cleaner. In any case, before going to the implementation, let's see how the state machine would look like if we implemented the full support for all the specifier fields. Just like before, we start in the normal state, and when encountering characters other than the percentage sign, we print them and advance to the next one. Previously, when encountering the percentage character, we move to the length state. Since we have a few extra fields in front of the length, we need to insert a couple of extra states here. And the first one would be the flex state. We remain in this state as long as there are valid flags, so we have another recursive transition here. When we no longer encounter valid flags, we can move on to the next field, which is the width. Same as with the flags, we remain in the width state until we encounter a period or a non-numeric character. In case we encounter the period, we must transition into the precision state, where we read the precision characters. Once we encounter a non-numeric character from either the width or precision state, we can jump to the length state. And from here the states look exactly the same as in the previous example. Now that we understand how the printf function works, let's get started on the implementation. I first declare the function in the stdio.h file with the cdecl calling convention. Next, I started by adding the while loop from the putest function. As we talked about earlier, we will implement a state machine and we'll start with the normal state. We will also need argp to keep track of the next argument, which will be initialized with the address of the format string. We know that the stack must be aligned to the size of the int data type, which is why I declared argp as an int pointer. Just before starting the loop, I incremented argp so it points to the second argument. While the code is correct right now, it would have probably been better to increment by the size of the format divided by size of int, so it also works if format is a far pointer. In the while loop, we will decide what to do next based on the current state, so we'll use a switch. For the normal state, we will decide what to do based on the current character, so I'll add a nested switch. If the current character is a percentage sign, we transition into the length state. We don't have to increment format because it is incremented at the end of the while loop. If the current character is something else, we just print it using put C. Next we will handle the length state. If the current character is h, we will use a variable to store that the length is short and then go into the short state. For the l case, we store the long length and go into the long state. For other characters, we jump to the specifier state. 
Here I use the go to statement to jump directly to the specifier state, without letting it exit the switch and continue the loop. Alternatively, we could move the format++ statement to the transitions which need the position to be incremented and not use go to. I know that many programmers are against go to, but personally I think it is very useful in some cases, like error handling or state machines, as long as it's used safely and responsibly. Next we have the short state, where we have only two transitions. If the character is another age, we store the length and move to the specifier state. For other characters, we jump directly to the specifier state. The long state looks basically the same. Finally, we have the specifier state, where we have more transitions. If the specifier character is C, the next argument is a character, so we print it an increment arg P. The size of a character is one byte, however the arguments are aligned to the size of the int data type, so we increment by one integer. In the S case we have a string, so the next argument is a pointer to the beginning of the string. This is another very simple case, we just call put S with the argument and move on to the next. In my implementation I only handled near pointers, but it might be a good idea to handle far pointers as well. If the specifier is a percentage sign, we just need to print a percentage character. Next we have the numeric specifiers. D and I are used to specify base 10 signed integers. Let's create a variable to store the numeric base as well and create a variable to specify whether the number is signed or unsigned. I will create a different function which will format and print the numbers, and it will take the length, sign and base as parameters. The function will return the incremented value of argp depending on the data type size. The u case is identical except that it is unsigned. x and p are used to specify unsigned hexadecimal numbers, so we will add that as well. Finally, we have the O case, which means an unsigned number in octal. If we encounter any invalid specifier characters, we will simply ignore them. Once we finish processing the specifier character, we can return to the normal state and reset all the variables to their defaults. Next, we need to implement the printf number function, which will take the argp, the length, sign, and base. The way this function will work is that we will convert whatever data type we get to an unsigned long long, and then convert that to a string. I also declare the buffer to store the formatted result, a number sign variable which will contain 1 or minus 1 depending on whether the number is positive or negative. The hex shards constant string will contain all the list of hexadecimal characters which should also cover the decimal and octal characters. The position variable will keep track of the current position in the buffer. I started by handling the length. For integers and anything smaller the code is the same. If the number is signed, we will need to check whether it's positive or negative. If the number is negative, we will negate and store minus 1 in the number signed variable. Then we can cast the number to unassigned long long. If the number is unsigned, all we have to do is cast to the larger long long int type. Finally, we increment argp by 1. The implementation for the long and long long lengths looks pretty much identical. Next we need to convert the number to a string. 
The way this is done is by repeatedly dividing by the base and using the remainder as an index in the hex characters array. We do this until the number reaches 0. And after exiting the loop, the buffer will contain the formatted number, but in reverse. This is not a problem, we will simply iterate and print it each character in reverse. Just before doing that, let's append the minus sign if required. Finally, we return the updated argp. This is pretty much the entire implementation of printf. Of course, there are some improvements that can be done, but this should work quite well for our needs. Let's compile and see what happens. Hmm, we are getting an error about u8dr being undefined. What's that all about? Below that error, there's another message that tells us that the missing symbol is coming from stdio.c, the file we are working on right now. The answer is that the compiler has generated for us a call to its standard library. However, we told it not to include it, so now we are getting a linker error. Why would the compiler do something like that? With some trial and error, by commenting sections of the code we just wrote, you should be able to find that the source of the problem is on line 209, where we are dividing the number by the base. The problem we are seeing is caused by a limitation of the x86 architecture, related to performing divisions. Here is the documentation for the div instruction. As you can see, the instruction works by dividing a larger dividend to a smaller divisor. The biggest possible number you can divide is a 128-bit number divided by a 64-bit divisor. However, this can only be used while the CPU is in 64-bit mode. In 16-bit real mode, where we are right now, we can divide at most a 64-bit number by a 32-bit divisor. Another requirement is that the quotient must fit inside the 32-bit register. Otherwise, the CPU will not be happy and it will trigger an exception that will result in a crash of our operating system. In C, even though radix and the rem variables are 32-bit, the compiler will automatically cast all the operands to the largest type before performing the operation, meaning that the compiler is trying to divide a 64-bit number by another 64-bit number. This is not something that the x86 CPU is capable of in the current mode of operation. The developers of the compiler have already thought of that and have created a function that they have put in the standard library, which can perform this division. Some of the older CPUs supported by this compiler don't even support 64 by 32 bit divisions, so there are a lot more of these functions, as well as signed variants. If you are curious, this is the source file where some of these functions are implemented. The name U8DR stands for Unsigned 8 Byte Division Remainder. Unfortunately, the implementation for this particular function is extremely complex and outside the scope of this video series so we will not be implementing it this way. We will take an easier route and implement something simpler. The processor is already capable of dividing 64-bit numbers by 32-bit numbers, with the limitation that the quotient must fit inside a 32-bit register. What we can do is use some math to address this limitation, and this way we will be able to obtain 64-bit quotients, which is all that we need. The way we can achieve this is with the long division technique from math that you most likely learned in school. Here's a quick example to jog your memory. Say we want to divide 2021 by 15. What we can do is take the first two digits, 20, and divide them by 15, which will give us the first digit of the quotient, 1, and the remainder, 5. Next, we take the remainder and append the next digit from the dividend, giving us 52, we divide again. We repeat these steps until we are out of digits. We can use this same technique to perform our division by splitting the 64-bit dividend into two. Let's say that we want to divide number 1111-2222-3333-4444 in hexadecimal by 123 in hexadecimal. First, we will divide the upper 32 bits 1111-2222 divided by 123, which will give us F03A2, 
and the remainder is FC. Next, we append the lower 32 bits of the dividend to the remainder, giving us FC 33334444. And now we can divide this number again by 1, 2, 3, and this will give us the result DDDD DDEC, and the remainder is 100. Putting the two parts together, our final result is F03A2 DDDD DDEC and the remainder is 100. Now let's get back to the code and implement this function. I just noticed something that I forgot to do earlier, which is this division right here. Without it, the code will go into an infinite loop and we'll never see anything on the screen. I will start by declaring the function in x86.h. We will again use the cdecl calling convention and we will return the quotient and remainder through pointers. Next I declare the function in assembly and added the code which creates and restores the call frame. First we will need to put the upper 32 bits of the dividend into EAX. The first parameter is at bb plus 4. Since numbers are encoded in little endian, the upper 32 bits will be located in the higher half of the memory, so at bp plus 4 plus another 4. Then we need to put the divisor in a register, like ECX. The dividend is 8 bytes long, so the divisor will be at bp plus 12. After clearing EDX, we can perform the first division. Now we have the quotient part in EAX and the remainder in EDX. Next we need to save the upper 32 bits to the output. First we need to load the address of the pointer in a register like BX. Even though the pointer is pointing to a 64 bit wide number, the pointer itself is only 16 bits in size because it is a near pointer. Then we write to the memory referenced by the pointer and store the quotient. Again, we have to store the upper bits in the upper half at bx plus 4. Now we can perform the second division, so let's load the lower 32 bits of the dividend into EAX. EDX already contains the old remainder, which is what we want, and the divisor is already stored in ECX. After performing the second division, all that's left to do is store the rest of the quotient and the remainder. BX already contains the address of the quotient, so we just have to copy EAX. For the remainder, we load it into BX first and then store the result. The remainder doesn't actually need to be 64-bit, 32-bit is enough. Finally, we save the registers that we modified, with the exception of EAX, ECX and EDX. In our case, that's only the BX register. Going back to the printf number formatting function, all that's left to do is call this division function we just wrote. The code now compiles, which is great. So let's add some test cases to the main function. I added quite a lot of cases here to cover all the specifiers and all the possible lengths, so we can test everything works as expected. I also added some negative numbers. Let's see what happens when we run this. And it works! Even the negative numbers and the large types work properly. That's very cool. Another success. Now that we have a working printf function, debugging will be a lot easier. Because now we can print things to the screen while the program is running. Today we demystified how printf works. In the next video we'll demystify something else, and we'll learn a lot more interesting things about how computers work. This is one of my favorite things about low-level programming, because you learn so much about how technology works and how computers work and you know, what makes all of these gadgets tick. And um, you also begin to appreciate how much effort has gone into them and, you know, how good the tools that we have today are in comparison to what they were. Thank you a lot for watching. And before closing, let me just tell you a bit about our Discord server. 
If you are having trouble following the tutorials or you have any questions or suggestions or you simply want to talk to other people interested in these low level programming topics or operating system development, come join us on Discord. You'll find the link in the description below. Again, thank you very much for your attention and see you next time. Bye bye.